I'm Joel Salatin, and our family owns Polyface Farm in Virginia. Uh, so we produce um, salad bar beef and pickerator pork and pastured poultry, uh, and we direct market it all to you know individuals there in the in the area. When we came in 1961, it was an eroded rock pile with gullies and everything and no soil. Today we've got. 8% organic matter and you know and, and, and abundance and so my message today will be about the the ethos the economy the uh, the empowerment and the elegance of uh, of conservation stewardship that's the idea thank you Daryl it is an honor indeed to be with you um, I'm <clears throat> I'm taken uh, I just have to pause and just appreciate the opening ceremony. Um, I got pretty choked up. You know, if you don't get choked up about those kind of things, uh, you don't have much in you, do you? So it's, it's good to be choked up. And men, you can be choked up too. It's okay. I'm an old crybaby, so it's easy. What I want to focus our attention this morning uh, for a little bit on is uh, if you'll allow me to label us, you, me, us. I'd like to call us resource stewardship ambassadors. You know, um, countries send ambassadors to represent them. Uh, different movements have you know, ambassadors. Uh, 4-H, FFA has ambassador programs. And so I think it would be good for us to think of ourselves as ambassadors of stewardship, of resource stewardship. Let me just give you a bit of context for those of you who've never heard of me, and I expect most of you are in that ballpark. Uh, I do farm full-time in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, came to the farm full-time in uh, September 24, 1982, and Teresa and I lived in the attic. We lived, drove a, a $50 car and lived on $300 a month. We grew all our own food, um, and we had a dream of trying to take this piece of land that mom and dad had bought with off-farm income, which is uh, a pretty normal thing. We'd come in 1961, I was just four, and uh, we'd come to this farm, and the reason that mom and dad bought it was because it was the cheapest place in the area, because back at that time, land was sold based on its productive capacity, and the productive capacity of this farm was gone. Over 150 years after settlement, our house was built in 1790, so we'd been there a little while. The point is that our conquistador abuse, and I'm using our very loosely here, cultural um, abuse of this land, uh, within 150 years, depending on who you wanted to read after, had lost three to five feet of topsoil. So that when we came in 1961, it was a gullied rock pile, the armpit of the community, but it was cheap. The beauty of biological things is that they can heal. That's the difference between machines and life. And uh, we can be thankful that, that life can heal, uh, including through forgiveness and other things. And so uh, we came and dad got a hold of some Andre Voisin stuff. And those of you who are into controlled grazing and managed livestock, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Andre Voisin, the Frenchman who was the guru of uh, controlled managed grazing and wrote still, you know, the iconic book, Grass Productivity. And that actually became Alan Savory's aha moment when he reread that book. When you hear his story, he'll tell you that it was that book that, that, that got him to make the time rest um, uh, ratio. And uh, so dad got a hold of this and looking at this rock pile, we had a, we, we, our deepest gully was 16 feet deep from the top to the bottom, 16 feet deep. We had these, all these hillsides. I mean, this was the breadbasket of the Confederacy during the war of Northern aggression. And uh, that gets a lot more response in Alabama, trust me. <laughs> and it gets nothing in Ohio, but anyway. Um, and, and uh, you know, all these hillsides were plowed 
and grown, uh, you know, wheat. Uh, Cyrus McCormick invented the reaper 10 miles from our house uh, in his blacksmith shop and then later, you know, eventually moved International Harvester out to Chicago where the, the new grain belt was. Why? Well, because we didn't have any soil left. And, um, and all our soil went down to the Chesapeake Bay. And so it was into this uh, context that Dad read this Andre Voisin and got, got the bug of, of, wow, you know, let, let's, let's look at this. And so, um, so we started looking at nature's template. How does nature operate? How does the, the ecology operate? And there, you know, there really aren't a lot of really uh, uh, difficult rules. Um, you know, one is there is no animal-less ecology. You know, the idea that you can have a functional ecology without animals is simply um, inaccurate. You can't do that, so we have to have animals. And nature runs on perennials more than annuals, so let's stimulate perennials. And nature, you know, puts down carbon on site, so let's deal with carbon. Let's, let's see if we can, you know, run fertility on carbon and not 10, 10, 10, chemical fertilizer. And, and so, you know, and, and animals, if you're going to have animals, animals move. Animals don't stay in buildings. They don't stay, you know, static. They, they move around. And so that, those basic uh, principles moved us to starting to develop uh, uh, portable systems uh, for, for multi-species, all portable systems. And, um, and gradually the farm, you know, uh, uh, developed. And uh, so the by the time I wanted to come back to it and try to make a living there for the first time, um, we, were on, we were on track with some pretty neat uh, ideas, but they hadn't really been proved out economically. And so today, um, we now own, you know, the, it was the, the 550 core acres, only 100 of pasture, 450 in woodland. We've added to that now a neighbor's place um, when they retired. And so we now own 650 acres, 175 acres of pasture, 475 of wood, so we're really a forest farm. And then we lease another 10 properties in the area, uh, moving us to toward um, uh, about 1,200 acres. And uh, we run about 1,100 head of cattle um, and um, poultry and pigs and chicken, uh, chickens, turkeys, eggs, broilers. And it's turned into a little bit of a more than a backyard operation. But it, uh, it, it supports 20, 20 salaries, and we're about $2.5 million in sales. So that's just a bit of a context of where we are. And so I've got four basic ideas here that I think uh, uh, can hopefully encapsulate uh, what I want to encourage you with or inspire you with, encourage you with here this morning. Uh, there, there are four E's, so if you're you know, wanting to remember this, this is in correct uh, homolytic uh, um, order here. So the first one is, uh, if we're going to be ambassadors of resource stewardship, we've got to develop an ethos, an ethos of, of, of value and worth, and I would suggest the first part of developing an ethos is to develop an understanding that you and I and all that we see are completely dependent on the soil, which is not an inert substance. I don't have to tell you, now when I do this speech for, you know, urban foodies, um, I have to go into a lot of detail about the soil, but I don't have to do that here because I know that you know that a double handful of, of healthy soil has more uh, beings in it than there are people on the face of the earth. We know that. Um, it, it's an entire community of beings, uh, actually 90% of which we still have not named. We've only named about 10% of all these beings in the soil. And so, you know, if we were to look at the soil through an electron microscope, you know, we would see this, you know, this kind of uh, four-legged kind of, you know, thing uh, marching along and um, uh, kind of slogging through the, you know, the, 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 the marsh um, universe of the soil. And uh, then, you know, from 10 o'clock, all of a sudden would, would come in some, uh, some six-legged thing with uh, uh, scissors on his head, you know, and he comes up to the bloop, 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 the thing, you know, marching along and, and whacks off his head, and, you know, eats it all up. And we're, you know, whoo, wow, that's amazing. We look in the electron microscope again, and boy, we cannot even recover from that first thing. Then here comes a 12-legged a narwhal-looking centipede thing, you know, and he comes on with a, you know, with a spear, and he... he pierces the edge of this, you know, uh, the, the viscous edge of this, you know, bloop, 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 the thing, grazing thing, you know, and he's headless now, and he pierces, and he's, 
and he sucks out the, you know, desiccates the thing, right? You know, this is all happening. You know, this, is, this makes Steven Spielberg like, look like a kindergartner. What I'm getting at is the awesome vibrance of life is more real, more, more uh, 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 powerful and profound and awesome than anything you and I can conceive. And our entire world that we see depends on this unseen reality that goes on miraculously under our feet. You know, this, this underground, uh, I, I, you know, the Star Wars has uh, Han Solo coming, you know, to that, to that uh, cafe, you know, and he's looking for... Uh, uh, not Han Solo, Luke Skywalker comes and he's looking for this fast transport, you know, and they come in and you got all these, you know, and they're all playing these crazy instruments, weird, you know, aliens and all this stuff. That's the way the soil is, you know. I, hey, hey, I've got, I've got two molecules of boron. I'll trade you for a couple polysaccharides out of that root glomalin. You know, I mean, that's, that's what happens. It's this whole underground commercial cafe going on. It's, it, it, it's amazing. And I think that, that in our messaging to the world, to the people around us, to create an ethos that you and I, are, we're human, human, humus. We are completely dependent on this invisible theater of activity under our feet. It's not just inert stuff. It's not just something to... To hold up plants, it, it is a it is a vibrant, active thing, and, and in fact, the only way that we can that we can fuel the three trillion bacteria for a Google engineer is because someone somewhere is leveraging this soil microbial community into fuel to the human microbiome in Silicon Valley. Okay, it's important to appreciate that. For, because, because our society has marginalized farming and ranching and anybody who gets dirt under their fingernails and gets splinters and calluses on their hands. You know, when's the last time you heard a guidance counselor at the high school tell an 11th grader, oh, wow, you've got really good grades. You're so smart, <laughs> you should be a farmer. But I would suggest that if you and I present the magic, the mystery, the awesomeness, the power, and the profound dependency that we have as an ethos in the soil, we should begin creating a magnetic appeal to soil stewardship and to caring for this unseen, invisible world that we all know is actually more important, more a measure of a nation's wealth than Wall Street. You know, when's the last time you heard somebody go into a banker for a loan and the banker says, wow, this is, a, you know, I, I, I'm from the South, so I can, I can do this, all right? You know, kind of the boss hog deal and the banker's, wow, man, this is, this is quite a business plan here. You know, they say business down South. They don't say business, they say business. You know, business, um, this is quite a business plan. In fact, uh, you're gonna be a millionaire, so I'd like to be your partner. Um, uh, can we go into partner on this uh, junction, this, uh, this uh, uh, endeavor, uh, but uh, I've got one, uh, one question before I give you the loan for a million dollars. Uh, my question is, what will this business do to the earthworms in our community? I mean, can you imagine? And yet, does anybody here think that the health and wealth and well-being of earthworms is not more important than Wall Street? Can you say amen? Amen. All right. So we're dependent. That's how we create an ethos, dependency. Number two is this ethos needs to be developed. We need to develop this soil ethos. We need to, we need to present the fact that we should, should be more than just conservationists. We should be regenerationists. And so our mandate is to leave more resource than we started with. I simply ask the question, what's God's return on investment? How do we get more soil, more hydration? So we believe that as a result of us walking on this uh, 
on this planet that we should leave as legacy to our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren more commons than was there when we started our life. Okay? That brings me to the second E. So we have ethos, and then we have, how do we do that? We have economy. So we have to create a stewardship economy, a stewardship that drives itself economically. And the bottom line here for me is that you can't have a stewardship ethic in a culture that actually puts destruction in a position of positiveness on the balance sheet. Just imagine with me. Imagine you've got your, most of us sitting here, we've got a, we've got a truck. You got a truck. Everybody's got a farm. Got to have a truck, right? Got to have a truck. All right, so we got a truck. Well, can you imagine an accounting system in which if I take that truck out and I wreck it, the cost of replacing that truck is viewed as income on my profit and loss statement. <laughs> we all laugh. We're, you're smiling. What kind of a nut does this guy come from? What kind of a planet? And yet, do you realize that in our country, our gross domestic product accounting system works that way? If we have to build more jails... That's an asset in the culture. Wow, we got activity. If I, if I pour junk in the creek and pollute it, the cost of cleanup adds economic activity and jobs. If we got more juvenile delinquents to take care of, hey, we got more counselors to hire. It's a growth industry. You know, as Wendell Berry says, he says, what's wrong with us creates more GDP than what's right with us. And so... What this, what this kind of, of accounting system does is that it creates an exploitive balance sheet on resources. Because it's not about how do we grow the resource, it's how do we exploit the resource as fast as possible. And there is no accounting for the depletion of a resource. All we account for is what we can get today. And so, if we're going to change that kind of economy, I suggest that we, first of all, need to appreciate we need to develop a carbon economy. Now, before you get anything in a wad here, I'm not presenting a cap and trade or, you know, some, some sort of a, a thing. No, I'm talking about a true decomposition engine. Talking to Jay last night, he's talking, talking about out at the experimental farm uh, that, 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 that all he does, one of the things that he does, is interested in, is tracking the carbon. Where, where is the carbon going? And so if we look at nature as template, we notice, indeed, it's all about biomass utilization and carbon runs in situ, okay? It's developed on site from the wood, from the forage, from, from bushes, from things that are growing. Woody things tend toward fungi and forages tend toward bacteria. And so on our farm, what we do is we actually incorporate the forest land into the open land. We have a big commercial chipper and we have a lot of woods. And so we work in the woods. We take out the crookeds, the junk, the, you know, all that stuff and chip that and that becomes biomass in, uh, in composting programs. Uh, what this means is that we would raise, we would, we would try to raise uh, long-stemmed varieties of grain, not short-stemmed varieties of grain. Um, in fact, that's been implicated now in the whole uh, gluten epidemic is, is the ratio between leaf and seed has changed in 50 years. And, and, and we've shortened the stem down to where there's no ratio of leaf to, to, to um, the grain anymore. Uh, the, the point is that, that, the, that nature's economy is about developing it in, on site. Um, it also means that we would start to honor organic matter. Carbon, of course, is closely related to organic matter. Uh, what's, why do we have to have organic matter? Well, uh, there's several really specific uh, beauties that organic matter brings to the soil. One is that it unleashes carbonic acid. So, um, so if you have rocks, anybody have rocks in your fields? Anybody got rocks here? Anybody pick rocks? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so here, here's my question. If you go out in your field and you pick up a rock, does that rock have all the molybdenum, boron, cobalt, zinc, you know, calcium uh, that it had 500 years ago, yeah, if it didn't, it'd be dissolved, right? 
well, what dissolves rock? How do, you, how do you get all those minerals out of rocks? Well, you can, I could bring that rock, set it up here on the, on the table and say, I wonder how much, you know, what, what's the mineral complexion of that rock? And we could treat it with hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, prussic acid, all sorts of things. But if we wanted the most efficacious acid to treat it with, to break out the minerals, you know what we treat it with? Carbonic acid. Now, when vegetable matter decomposes in the soil, it it exudes carbon dioxide, CO2. When CO2 interacts H2O, all right, I'm not a chemist, but I do know this, okay? CO2 plus H2O equals carbonic acid. So many times our mineral deprivation in our soils generally is not because we don't have enough minerals. Everybody's got fields full of rocks. Our problem is we don't have enough organic matter decomposition going on. How do we get organic matter decomposition? We have in situ carbon going in there, whether we supply it with composting, wood chipping, long stemmed varieties, for you know, whatever. The point is to stimulate the carbonic acid cycle. Another reason is because every 1% increase of organic matter equals 20,000 gallons of extra water retentive capacity. Every 1%. Of organic matter because it's the porosity, it's the it's the you know it's the sponge of the soil, and so uh, every one percent. So when our farm was one percent organic matter when we came in 1961, one percent organic matter. I mean, it was gone. It was rocks. It was nothing. In fact, there was so little soil when we started controlled grazing, we did not have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. So Dad poured concrete and used car tires, shoved a half inch. Uh, uh, little metal pipe down in there and my brother and I you know we were like five and eight years old and the two of us could could heave these he'd put them on the, the tractor platform and drive real slow through the field uh, through the rock pile and and my brother and I could could get on the edge of these and kind of tip them off of the tractor platform and then dad would go and stick electric fence stakes in them and that's how we built electric fence because we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes and these were all areas that 500 years ago had five feet of soil on them. But good Presbyterians and Methodists and Lutherans put money in the plate to send money to missions all over the country while they were washing their fields down to the Chesapeake Bay. Okay. So we've now gone, our latest soil tests are over 8% organic matter and we don't use the concrete tires anymore. All those rock piles have about uh, 12 inches of soil on them. It's not a lot, but it's 12 inches, more than it was 60 years ago, okay? So going from 1% organic matter to 8% organic matter, that's an addition of 140,000 gallons per acre times 100 acres, <laughs> all right? 11.4 million gallons of extra water that we can hold today that we couldn't in 1961. That's pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. That's not bragging. That is simply humbly playing acknowledgement to these beautiful templates that a great creator designer made. And our mandate is to figure out how to, how to caress them. And we've got this idea that nature is some reluctant partner that we've got to get in a half Nelson and, 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 and I'm going to make you produce and I'm going to make you do this. When actually nature is a benevolent lover that we need to learn how to caress because she wants to give us abundance, not scarcity. Another reason to increase organic matter is that it unleashes the microorganism uh, uh, community in our favor. Two examples I can give you. One is azotobacter bacteria. Ever heard of azotobacter bacteria? We're all familiar with the rhizomes on the end of legumes, you know, that, that concentrate nitrogen. Well, azotobacter are actually uh, a nitrogen-free, free bacteria that, that don't depend on anything. I mean, they don't depend on, on legumes. They just live in the soil, but they're dormant until the soil is 4% organic matter. If you're less than 4% organic matter, they just go into hibernation. But at 4% organic matter, they all, I guess, talk to each other and say, hey, it's okay, we can come out now, you know, we can come out and play. And, and uh, they will actually bring in 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year if they're active. Can I hear it for organic matter? Hey, hey, okay. 
And how about, how about another one? This is a huge one that's really uh, just kind of come to the fore because, you know, the, the anti-animal movement is, so, uh, is growing so rapidly, especially in our urban sectors. The, the, uh, the disease of uh, the, the urban disease called veganism And essentially, you know, it says that um, cows are, you know, burping and farting and destroying the planet. And um, so there's, there's another bacteria that's really come to the fore. It's called methanotrophic bacteria, methanotrophic bacteria. And um, they don't live under concrete. They don't live under schoolyards. They don't live under uh, cornfields. They don't live under plowed fields. Uh, they live under perennial prairie, perennial pastures that are healthy. And, and a healthy uh, population of methanotrophic bacteria will reach out and grab the equivalent methane of 1,000 cows per acre and put it in the soil. So... There's a lot of reasons to increase that organic matter. That is part, that is real economy. That's real economy. If I can get my soil to reach out and grab nitrogen out of the air, who wants to quit buying any nitrogen? Okay, this is a true economy. The next part of this whole uh, uh, carbon economy is perennials versus annuals. The energy flow, as you all know, the energy flow of perennials and annuals is completely different. Annuals are extractive and they put all the energy up here in this big plump squash or seed or watermelon or whatever. Perennials, the energy flow is all about going into this root mass that, that is the bank account, the savings account for the plant. Uh, and in controlled grazing, we call this pulsing the pasture, this whole, you know, this whole uh, rest and growth cycle because pulsing is like a heartbeat and we're actually pumping the energy into the pasture as we prune off that biomass. So that's why in nature, the, the, all the deep soils on the planet are not under trees. They're not under bushes. They're certainly not under corn and soybeans. They're under perennial prairie pastures with herbivores running across them that are exhibiting three M's. I call it moving, mobbing, and mowing. They're not in the same place. They're not in the same field. They move. The migratory choreography is, is amazing. Um, but, but they move along, they're mobbed up for predator protection, and they're mowing. They're not eating dead cows and dead chickens and, you know, ho-ho cakes left over from Pillsbury and all that stuff. They're, 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 they're mowing, okay? And the problem, the, 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 uh, the dysfunction of modern cattle production is the reason that we have things like cowspiracy and what the health and the UN Long Shadow Report and all this science impugning livestock farming is not because cows are bad, it's because we're managing them bad. And when you, when you uh, uh, abrogate any one of these three, moving, mobbing, mowing, you have what nature wants to have, this beautiful choreography of symbiosis and synergistic soil development. And what you do is you have dysfunction. It would be equivalent to, let's say we were from Pluto. And Pluto said, look down at Earth and said, hmm, I wonder what kind of education program they have. So, you know, you and I got picked to get in our little saucer, you know, and they send us down to the Earth. And we, you know, we, and we land in the worst school district of the worst uh, uh, county in the, with the worst superintendent, with the worst school board, in the worst school, with the worst principal, in the classroom, with the worst teacher, and the worst kids, with the worst parents in the country. And we go back to Pluto in two days, and we give our report, our scientific report. And you know what our report says? Man, those people would be better if they didn't have a school. And that's why we have millions and millions proliferating around the planet saying we'd be better if we didn't have a cow. Not because cows are bad, but because their management is not capturing nature's template of moving, mobbing, and mowing. And so because we move our cows every single day to a new, a new paddock, we have been able to go. Now, I told you what our farm was like. Okay, again, it's not bragging. This is simply giving glory to a beautiful template, all right? So our county average is 80 cow days per acre. So in our county, 80 cow days per acre. So uh, that's, that's the average. Um, a cow day is what one cow will eat in a day. Take all the food you're going to eat in a day, put it on a plate. That's one person day of food. Well, one cow, one cow eats in a day is one cow day. So in our county, it's 80 cow days is the average. On our farm, we average 400 cow days per acre because of this high level of management. Now, if you want the economics of this, basically, land that will produce 100 bushel corn will produce 400 cow days per acre of native grasses. So this is the, this is the equivalent. 
100 bushel corn to 400 cow days per acre of pasture. Now, I asked several guys, I said, because I didn't know how much corn you can produce around here. So they said anywhere from 120 to, you know, a really good farmer around here might get 170, whatever. So just for fun, I assumed 150 bushel corn grown right here. That's equivalent to 600 cow days per acre in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, native perennial forages. So if we assume calf gains of one and a half pounds per day, Everybody, is that okay? One and a half pounds per day gain on calf? All right, good, good. I don't, I don't want to get too far out of the, yeah, this is a, this is a, fi, you know, a feeder calf, all right? And we figure that that feeder calf is three quarter of a cow equivalent, not quite half, they're going to be a little over half, so say they're three quarter of a cow equivalent. That means we've got 750 calf days times one and a half pounds per day is um, 1,075, 1,075 calf. Uh, calf uh, um, pounds pounds per acre per year what's that calf worth buck 20 is that fair enough dollar 20 a pound is that okay okay all right uh, times 100 times uh, one dollar and 20 cent a pound is one thousand two hundred and ninety dollars per acre how many beef cattle farmers around here are grossing in $1,290 per acre on beef cattle. Okay. This is my challenge. This is my challenge. Okay. This is the potential. This is the potential. I love doing this in Kankakee, Illinois, where they just normally get 200. Then you get 800. It just gets better and better and better. Uh, and trust me, is anybody doing that with corn? No. Okay. And this doesn't require a combine, <laughs> doesn't require a grain drying bin, doesn't require a grain hauling truck, doesn't require anything but a four-wheeler maybe, okay, and some fence and some water line. The point is, why would anyone grow corn? This is the economy, this is the carbon economy, and part of the carbon economy is also hydration, okay? P.A. Yeomans, the iconic Australian who wrote Water for Every Farm, said the weak link on every single farm is water. Okay, and when you consider that 500 years ago, 8% of the American landscape was water from 200 million beavers, beaver ponds. Now we're what, 0.5% water. Imagine what 8% water would look like on the landscape. Imagine what that would do to temper ambient air temperatures, to stimulate transpiration, cloud formation, good weather patterns. Imagine what that would do. Uh, wildlife, I mean, it would go, Nature Conservancy would go nuts, all right? Um, the way we get hydration is to recreate these, um, is to recreate this not only organic matter, but the, hydra the, the beaver ponds. Um, if there's one great use of petroleum, it is to run earth-moving equipment to rebuild the beaver ponds. And we can do the beavers one better because we don't have to go to running water. We can go to places where there's no running water just to catch rain events. And the, the beauty of catching rain events, permaculture style, permaculture on high ground instead of uh, uh, the beaver pond on low ground in running water, is that we can get it higher on the landscape so we can gravity feed it and use it better. You know, uh, Lewis Bromfield writing in the 1950s about his Malabar farm in soil development, he said, you know what, the answer to the flooding in the Mississippi and the flooding in the country is not more big Army Corps of Engineers projects on the big rivers. It's already too much volume and too velo much velocity to deal with at that point. What it, what it requires is millions and millions of little farm ponds all over the landscape like big cow footprints. Imagine babe and blue ox, you know, uh, Paul Bunyan and, 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 you know, and, and, and millions and millions and millions of little farm ponds. It's not about big centralized projects. Most of our big problems have little solutions. But the little solutions have to be duplicated over and over and over again a little bit of time. You know, your, your marriage problem is not a big solution is a lot of little solutions, like little lovey cards and kind words and kisses, okay? It's a lot of little things done right. We, we, we love to think, we got a big problem, we got to have a big solution. You know, we're built that, we love it, my monkeys, ah, you know, big, no, 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 no. Actually, our biggest problems 
just require a lot of little solutions done over and over and over. And so we believe, so, so on our farm, we've built, you know, like 15 ponds. We can now irrigate with the K-line system, which stimulates our biomass accumulation factor. The point is that if all the money that had been spent in tillage for the last 150, 200 years had instead been put in strategically placing high permaculture style ponds in the landscape, today we would be flood proof and drought proof and would have recreated Eden. We believe that bringing that kind of redemptive capacity to the landscape is the human mandate. See, we live in a time where the, where the radical environmental movement often in, 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 in rightly grieving over what we have done, and I get it, I grieve too, okay? But at the end of grieving, you gotta dust yourself off and say, well, now what do we do? And what do we do is not ecology by abandonment. It's not, oh, we can't ever touch nature, so we have to walk away and lock it all up in wilderness areas and parks and all this stuff so, so it can never be desecrated by human breath. But rather, to use our intellectual capacity and our mechanical ability, you know, opposing thumbs, and, and, par and, and participate with redemptive capacity into the landscape. The third part of, um, of the, the uh, carbon economy is equity is in management, all right? So we're replacing energy intensity, pharmaceutical intensity, and capital intensity with people. So on our farm, people say, well, to move all this stuff around, all these animals around, all this stuff, you know, it, it, it takes more people. And they say it with a little bit of a curl lip, derisively, condescendingly, as if more people on farms would be Neanderthal barbaric. See, the problem is the average farmer is 60 years old. 60 years old. If there's one elephant in the room of stewardship, it is how do we transition 50% of America's agriculture equity in the next 15 years? How do we transition that in the next 15 years? 50%. That's never happened in any civilization in history except in conquest. You know, the Huns come in and sack Rome or whatever. But other than that, there's never been a time in human history when 50% of the agrarian equity, land, buildings, machinery, has changed hands in 15 years. Well, the reason that the average farmer is so old is because when the young people can't get in, the old people can't get out. So if we're going to create a transitionary pathway, we have to reduce the capitalization hurdles of entry. And so on our farm, if you want to get into you know, our model with the portable infrastructure, let's say chickens, all right, if you want to raise a chickens for Tyson, the first thing you get a half a million dollar facility. I call that a barrier to entry. But with a portable pasture chicken model, little 10 by 12 floorless shelters, all you need is to cancel your Netflix, uh, Netflix subscription, don't go out to eat one month, take your extra pennies, build one, you're in the chicken business. And you don't even have to own the land that it's on. You can put it on a wheat farm, an orchard, a, a beef cattle farm, and you can place this farm. So now you have mobile, a mobile farm. And so, you know, with mobile infrastructure, you don't have to capitalize the farm. Suddenly now that's a pathway in for a young person. And the beautiful thing is mobile infrastructure, the government doesn't know what it is. You know, what, is that a building? No, it doesn't need a permit. Oh, is it, you know, is it a machine? No, it doesn't need depreciation. It's nothing, and I love farming where my equity is nothing. Um, so, so it, it, you know, it's mobile, and, it, and it's modular, okay? If you, if you, so if you like them, you can build another one and another one and another one. I mean, we've got the equivalent of a Tyson chicken house, but it's in 150 little modules, which allows you to scale with retained development and you don't have to borrow money in order to do that. And then it's management intensive. So we're, we're, we're substituting energy intensity, pharmaceutical intensity and capital intensity with people. And I don't apologize for that because what that means is it moves our equity from all of these other things to skill, knowledge and customers. And I've never met a banker who said, I'm gonna foreclose on your skill or I'm gonna repossess your knowledge, yet. <laughs> so management equity provides a pathway in. Number three, the third part, I'm watching the clock. Um, third part here is, um, is elegance. So we've got ethos, 
We've got economy, and then we have what I call elegance. Um, I mean, I could have called it something else, but I had to have an E, right? So uh, John Eichert, uh, professor emeritus retired from University of Missouri, developed this list, which I just think is so profound. The difference between the in, an industrial paradigm versus a nature paradigm. And let's go down through this. Four pillars of the industrial, uh, uh, the industrial model, uh, he says, are simplification, specialization, routinization, and mechanization. Simplification, specialization, routinization, mechanization. Think down through the industrial model. That's exactly what it's about. Uh, um, you know, simplification. Um, how do we? How do we? And I've heard twice already here talking with other uh, Daryl and Jay and others um, about the, the simplified landscape in North Dakota, and they say it with great uh, concern. Okay, the simplified landscape. Um, specialization. You know, we want to either grow wheat or we want to grow cow. You know, we don't want to do a bunch of things. Routinization, we'll do the same thing every day, same thing every year, same thing over and over. Mechanization, it's all about, you know, how can we get the people out and do the mechanics. Nature is opposite. It's not simplified, it's complex. It's not specialized, it's diversified. It's not routinized, it's dynamic, spontaneous. Things Things change because nature has a mind of its own and it's, it's responding to all these different things. And it's not mechanized, it's biological. So when we're working with the land, we're working with food and farming systems, we need to think about complexity, diversity, dynamism, and biology. Okay? That will head us down a pathway. See, the, th the, th the fact is that we have become extremely genius about innovating things that we can't physically, mentally, emotionally, or morally metabolize. My dad used to call this overrunning our headlights. Jurassic Park, the movie, um, you know, you have this, uh, this professor that's figured out how to clone these, you know, raptors and they're destroying civilizations. We know it, all this mayhem is going on. And, and he's euphoric over, oh, look what I've done, look what I've accomplished. And, the, and the, you know, his alter, you know, the archetype, the alter ego, the journalist gets in his face and he says, but sir, just because we can, should we? It's a powerful, profound question. And we have become a nation of technicians. And we reward our technicians. You know, Amazon's just had all the news about their new fulfillment centers out on the East Coast, and they're going to pay an average of $150,000 uh, salaries. And we, we honor our technicians, but we don't honor our prophets and poets. Our technicians figure out how. Our prophets and poets dare to ask why. We figured out how to grow corn with chemical fertilizer from the Middle East on driverless GPS robotic John Deere tractors that don't even need a person. And nobody's asking, but why are we growing all this corn? And so I would suggest that elegance requires a couple things. One is it requires integration rather than segregation an integration system rather than segregated system. We want to close the loops, close the loopholes, stop the leaks. Um, we have a fundamentally segregated system. And yes, I know these are very powerful words, but we need powerful words. We, as we take our message out and our mission out, we need powerful words, don't we? The, the, the time of, of just man be pan being around while our soil runs down the river, it's time to take the gloves off and use strong words. And I like integration versus segregation. And so if we're going to have an integrated system, we need to close the loops. We need to close the leaks and stop the leaks, the leaks of soil, the leaks of water, the leaks of immunological dysfunction, uh, the, the disease leaks. I mean, the, the fact that our country now leads the world in chronic morbidity is not a place to be number one. You know, you like to be number one with your Olympic team. You like to be number one with your, you know, golf team. You like to be number one with all these things. But to be number one in chronic morbidity, this is not the place to lead the world. And perhaps we lead the world there because we have not developed an ethos of soil conservation. We have not developed a dependency on this unseen landscape under our feet. We need to change up the land use. 
you know, rotate crops, plant cocktails, uh, use microsites, roofs, aspect, uh, buildings, and, and, and all sorts of, you know, landscape features, all right, to change up the land use. This is part of the elegance of the landscape to, to create a mosaic. Sometimes we call this mosaic farming. You know, one of the, one of the beauties of mosaic farming is, uh, just for an example, is that you have something in bloom all the time. We just had a Smithsonian study finished. It was a two-year Smithsonian study. Um, on, on working landscapes in Virginia, we were site number 29, and um, and uh, we were the only we were the only site that they used where we were actually actually using uh, the 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 test sites. Everything else they were they were outside the fence. They were some sort of a conservation easement or some sort of a riparian buffer, some sort of thing that wasn't actively being used. Ours were all actively being used. Interestingly, we had all eight. Uh, uh, varieties of bumblebees that are known to exist in Virginia on our little farm. Why? Well, because this, you want me to do it, Daryl, just, just to show I can do it? All right. Mob stocking, herbivorous solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration, fertilization. Because of that, we've got this mosaic, so there's always something in bloom out there. And that stimulates the pollinators. Pollinators are struggling today. Okay, pollinators are considered kind of a canary in the mine. All right, and and if our pollinators are hurting, we're not in good shape. All right, and and so we need we need to, to change up the landscape mosaic. All right, uh, 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 that's part of this complexity and diversity of nature's template, uh, and 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 then complementary enterprises, stackable holons, let animals do the work. So you know we make you know hundreds and hundreds of tons of compost every year. We don't do it with big machinery. We do it with piggerators, and so the cows are on hay. They're under an awning, not even a, a side on the barn, you know, we just, we just have an awning, we have gates that, that, that roll up, you know, and the cows eat through them, and as the, we, we use the, the chipper and the wood material, the carbon on site to generate a carbonaceous diaper under the cows, carbonaceous diaper, they're dropping 50 pounds of goodies out their back end every day, and we, we sponge all that up, uh, hooked up with carbon, so there's no volatilization if it gets dry, no leaching if it gets wet. And then we add corn to it. The corn goes in there and it ferments in this anaerobic bedding pack that the cows are tromping out the oxygen in. And when the cows come out to start grazing, we put in the pigs. The pigs then seek the fermented corn in the bedding pack, aerate it, pig aerators, pig, you know, like aerobic, you know, Jane Fonda, dance, left, always left, left, left. So, <clears throat> a little bit esoteric for you. You didn't get it. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> The, the, the point is that we've got this, this uh, the, the pigs then come in and the pigs then do all this uh, um, oxygenation work, convert it from, from anaerobic fermented uh, carbonaceous diaper to, to aerobic compost, which then goes back out on the field for the compost. So it's not like we're not, we're not buying any chemical fertilizer. We haven't spent a dime on chemical fertilizer. We haven't planted a seed in 60 years, but we do invest in mosaic management and carbon development okay that's our fertility and so letting the pigs do the work suddenly makes the pigs now not just you know spare ribs and and and, and uh, you know, pork chops uh, the pigs are now fellow laborers in this great land healing ministry you know there's this there's this spiritual application of it an emotional connection that really changed it. So stackable whole lawns, let animals do the work. Egg mobiles, you know, we don't shoot the cows up with ivamec and things that make all the, you know, that make the meat so bad it kills all the bugs, anything like that. You know, eh, well, maybe I don't have worms if I eat it, but I might have something else. So what we do is we run egg mobiles behind the cows and the, the cows move and the egg mobiles come behind them. Then the 800 chickens go out and they scratch through the cow patties, eat out all the fly larvae, eat the grasshoppers and crickets uh, that are now exposed from the grazing and turn all that into eggs. And so we get $100,000 worth of eggs a year as a byproduct of pasture sanitation okay that's complementary enterprises all right the fact is that there's not a single farmer or a single farm on the planet that is fully leveraging and capturing its resource base every farm could triple or quadruple its income you know what then you could hire the son or the daughter and you could have a multi See, I don't believe a farm ultimately is a sustainable farm until it employs two people from two different generations. Otherwise, that farm business will simply run the trajectory of life. Finally, number four, empowerment. All right, 
So you've heard the mandate, you've heard the mission, you've heard the messaging, you've heard this, all this stuff. Now, after this conference, empowerment of neighbors, of collaborators, of farmers we're working with, of city cousins. We need to empower them to do this, which means we need vision. How can it help? We need to present this so that it helps all parties. It's not just do this because there's a grant, do this because there's a tax subsidy, do this because there is economic validity, there is environmental validity. And as we enjoyed this opening ceremony this morning, my, the thought that just kept hitting my mind as I enjoyed basking in this, in this heartland exercise that you, trust me, you don't see this in New York. You don't see what you just did in New York. Doesn't happen. Is I'm just sitting there thinking, legacy. This is legacy, and that's good. Part, the, so, so first, we, we, need to, we need to capture, I hope, what I've tried to message here this morning a little bit as vision, and we need, to let, we need to be willing to embrace big vision, big picture, big stuff, okay, with a lot of little solutions. Empowerment requires coaching. I think I'm looking at the coaching staff. We live in a time of coaching. We have so techni technicalized, I don't think that's a word, but you know what I'm talking about. We've so technicalized our culture that everybody is scared to do new things, to try new stuff. I mean, because if you hit the wrong button on your laptop, it suddenly goes, woo, you know, and then, oh no, what did I just do? And so, so we, we have become timid about trying new things. And so coaches, are all about hand-holding, walk our people through. I mean, we have coaches for, we have wellness coaches, diet coaches, fitness coaches, um, uh, investment coaches. It, we live in a time of coaching because in segregated, in segregated think, we have become narrowly focused in expertise and we're not eclectic anymore. We learn one little narrow discipline and nobody knows how to pull a spark plug on a car. I mean, does a spark plug in a car even have spark plug anymore? I don't know. But... I mean, that shows my ignorance, okay? The, the, the point is that we, we have become incredibly disempowered from, from doing things because we've become so technical in all these little things. And so I would suggest that you need to proudly wear the badge, conservation coach. How about that? Conservation coach. All right, And we need to present ourselves to our communities, to our affiliates, as I'm here as a coach. I'm not here as a, as a regulator. I'm not here as a hammer. I'm here as a coach cheerleader. That's what people need to be empowered. And finally, and I close with this, we need a climate of experimentation. Okay, We need to encourage folks with freedom to fail. Because... All of us are under this kind of cloud or remembering some matriarch or patriarch in our family. Remember what they said? They said, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. You know what? Hate to tell you this. Grandma was wrong. Okay? Grandma was wrong when she said that. You know what the truth is? The truth is, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. We don't do anything right first. I mean, imagine you're at Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's coming up next week or whatever, uh, this week, isn't it? Um, well, I don't even know what day it is. All right. Um, I'm on a crazy trans, uh, travel thing. I don't know where I am. I'm in Dakota, North Dakota. Um, so you got Thanksgiving dinner next week and all the whole, you know, uh, family comes. And, uh, and the newest addition to the family, you know, this little, uh, you know, eight-month-old toddler, little, uh, we'll call her uh, Susie May, right? Susie May, okay? And she's crawling around on the floor, you know, on the adultery, you know, you know, talking, you know, and probably arguing and whatever else, okay? And, and, uh, and suddenly little Susie May, you know, she, she comes over and she, she grabs a chair leg and she kind of stands up and she's kind of, you know, toddling there. And probably her mom sees her first and says, oh, 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 look, you know, Susie May, she, she stands the first time she's ever stood. You know, look at it. You know, of course, all the adults immediately, you know, oh, look at little Susie May. And Susie May suddenly realized she's the center of attention, you know, and suddenly her, you know, her, her happiness turns into terror, you know, Ooh, and I'm the object of attention. She, she loses her grip and she falls down on her diaper. What does everybody say? Well, Susie May, if you can't walk any better than that, just quit, because if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. <laughs> no, 
oh, what did I say? They say, oh, come on, we'll put your hands up here. Let's try again. Right, right, right. But something happens as, our, as we become adults, don't, doesn't it? it be, we, we become timid and petrified of failure, of not doing it right the first time. We're so scared of that. And so part of our job, I think, as, as innovation, stewardship, conservation coaches is to create our climate in our circles and our spheres of influence so that people know that it's okay to fail. It's okay to do poorly first because nobody eats right, walks right, talks right, poop. Well, I guess we poop fine. We just don't know where to put it. We don't do any of that well at first. And so we need to give room for folks to try and innovate and, and encourage failure. And it's okay because that's how we learn. Is everybody up for that? Yes. Okay. So let's, let's wear our conservation coach badge proudly on our chest. Let's make room to experiment, room to innovate, try new things, not be judgmental, and create room for our affiliates and our, and our, our rural areas to become all the conservationists that we would like them to come. And that will move our mission to a new plane of success and joy. Now may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large but not pithy. May tomato blossom end rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. <laughs> may, your, may the coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectably palatable. May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise and call you blessed, and may we all make a nest a better place than we inherited. God bless you. Thank you so much.